morning. We welcome you here to the Canton United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Clay. It's a delight to meet together as the family of God to rejoice in the truth of our scripture, the truth of our faith, that Jesus is with us as we gather in his name this morning. I want to invite us into worship uh, and into a time of just uh, thinking about what it means uh, to be full service. Um, I was uh, thinking about this all week, and uh, I went from living in Sioux Falls for college and seminary to living in Brookings as the associate pastor and then moving to Burke, South Dakota. And there were a lot of things I had to get used to living in a town of 600 people again. Uh, there was one time I was getting ready for youth group, and I was like, oh, I need this for youth group. I'm going to go to the store and buy it. <laughs> no, I was not. <laughs> I was going to deal with it is what I was going to do. But the thing that threw me off the most was the first time I went to the grocery store. And I checked out my groceries, and then a kid named Nathan Hay grabbed my groceries to take them to my vehicle. I had forgotten that carry-out was a thing, because I had lived in larger places for long enough. You just kind of take care of yourself, and I, I don't like it. <laughs> I have learned that I don't care for someone else carrying my groceries out. I can take care of that myself. Thank you very much. It depends upon your age. <laughs> it does depend upon your age, yes. <laughs> But even like the size of the order, it didn't matter. If I had two things, I'm fine carrying that. If I had 25 things, I just, I, I, you don't, I, that is weird to me. But the world is more self-service, not self-serving, it is, but we're not going to talk about that today. The world is more self-service, but yet all throughout the gospel, Jesus calls us to be full service. Jesus calls us to look out for the needs of others and to fill those needs and to work out of this heart and out of this desire to just make things better for other people. Jesus did that himself throughout his ministry, and Jesus has called all of his disciples into that work, and that's the work that we're going to be talking about today as we look at what Jesus says when a couple of his disciples are looking for greatness in all the wrong places. Being full service means serving fully. So let's that, let that be on the, full, on the forefront of our minds as we go through worship this morning. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we hear our prelude for this morning from Sharon. Thank you. 
Thanks, Sharon. As you are comfortable, I want to invite you to stand uh, to rejoin in our responsive call to worship. The responses will be on the larger yellow text on the screen this morning. Dear friends in Christ, we come before God as equal in God's sight. God knows us thoroughly and loves us None of us is perfect and without blemish. Dear friends, we are called to joyful love and service in God's realm. Thanks be to this God, who trusts us and pours abundant love on us. Our opening song this morning is found on page 407 of your United Methodist hymnal. We're going to turn and sing together, Close to Thee. The words will also be on the screen for you this morning as well. You may be seated. And as you're seated, I invite you to turn your attention to page 581 of the, United, of the United Methodist hymnal as we continue to praise God in song by singing, Lord, whose love through humble service. On 581, the words are also on the screen this morning as well.
Let us join together in a moment of congregational prayer as we pray the, to his, the prayer that is on the screen for us this morning. Together we pray, Lord, everywhere we look, we see the imprint of your creative love. The wondrous works of nature show your majesty. As we gather today to celebrate your love and creation, keep us mindful that we are a part of that created order. You mean for us to be stewards and caregivers and not destroyers and consumers. Prepare us to work for you in ministries of peace, service, and justice. Amen. Let's turn in our faith. We sing the smaller black hymnal in your hymnal racks. We're going to turn to page 2176 and sing together, Make Me a Servant. Make me Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for drawing us together here in this space and here virtually um, as the opportunity to just gather as your people. We give you thanks for the truth of your word in our lives, for the way that you just help us to draw hope and strength and peace in times of weakness and chaos and sorrow from its words. We give you thanks for the gift of your abiding presence and your abiding promise to be with us always and the ways that we just lean on that throughout all of our lives. God, we just also give you thanks for the way that you turn our eyes outward, for the ways that you move and work in our world, and the way that you reveal what, what we should be about, what we should be doing, and how we should be in service to you. Not for our own glory, but God, for yours. And God... As we've shared our joys and concerns this morning, we know that you have moved in our hearts to share these things. And we know that you join us in prayer, that you meet us in prayer, and that you are moving and working in the situations that we have discussed this morning. We pray for those that are going through health trials, that are preparing for surgeries that are major and minor and scary and routine. We pray for those that mourn today, the loss of loved ones. We pray over this flooding in New Mexico that you would bring relief and that, that the, the news that Sarah and Thad would hear would, it would be good news for their family. We give you thanks for birthdays and for harvest and for new jobs. We give you thanks for those that answer your call to service and serve in the life of the church and serve beyond the life of the church. We just simply give you thanks for who you are and how you are made known to us in the midst of all things. Inspire our faith today, O oh God, to make it look like the faith of Jesus, your Son, our Christ the one who taught us how to pray together in the first place, saying, Pray this way, our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, I want to invite our kids forward for a time that's mostly just for them. And we also have a special guest coming to help with the children's sermon this morning. So I'm going to invite my special guest up at this time as well. Good morning, friends. How's it going? Good. Good morning, Simon. How are you, buddy? All right. Hi, Peachy. So if you are a part of Chi Alpha on Wednesday nights, you might recognize the friend that I have helping me with the children's sermon this morning. Does everyone know my friend Carla? Can you tell Carla good morning? good morning? Good morning, Carla. I'm so glad you're with me this morning. And I brought Carla up for a very specific reason, and that is because I asked her on Wednesday to help me by answering some questions that I think we might, some of us might know the answers to. And the first question is this. Carla, do you happen to know the name of the last three winners of the Heisman Trophy for college football? No. I'm too old. I remember <laughs> Herschel Walker and some of those, but not the recent ones. There you go. We don't know the, the names of the last three um, the last three Heisman winners. Carla, do you happen to know? You actually might know this one just based on being in the financial world. Do you know the, who the three most wealthiest people are in the world? Not necessarily in the world, but Elon Musk is one. Um, we've got... Um, Warren Buffett down in Nebraska. Danny Sanford in Sioux Falls is pretty well. Wow. Okay. So we do know a few of those when that's pretty awesome. I actually would make the same list. And do you happen to know who the three most recent winners of the Miss America pageant are? Nope. <laughs> Me neither. I could maybe come up with three Heisman winners, but definitely not the three most recent Heisman winners. Um, Eric Crouch is one of them because he played for Nebraska. Um, but yeah, and Herschel Walker and, and Matt Leinert comes to mind also, but I could, I could, I could name them three most recent. Um, I could probably make the same list of wealthiest people and I have absolutely no idea about the Miss America pageant. But Carla, could you tell me three teachers who helped you through school? Well, my favorite teacher was actually from Chamberlain, Mike Garnes. He taught in Minnesota. I also had Mr. Putzier, who was a great science teacher, and then Mel Kriz was my typing teacher, aka now keyboarding. Nice. And how about three friends that helped you through a difficult time? There's a lot of um, there's a lot of people in this church that have helped us through some tough times. A um, couple of my coworkers, Kathy and. Um, Kay and you know my parents of course helped through tough times yeah and how about three people who make you feel appreciated Wow, um, all of these kids that come to Chi Alpha I mean you know just seeing the smiles on their faces as they're going through the line to get their food um, so that's more than three mm-hmm Nice. So friends, can you tell me which questions were easiest to answer? The ones about really important and kind of celebrity type people or the ones that were more personal to Carla? Yeah, the ones that were more personal to Carla were easier to answer. So today we're talking about what it means to make a difference in somebody's life. And while there are cool people like celebrities in the world and there are people that are influential in, in different ways, um, the, the things that mean the most to us, the people that make the biggest impact are the people that are closest to us. And so if you want to make a difference in the world, do you think that you need to have a lot of money or have a lot of followers on TikTok or, or um, you write a lot of books? No. No. If you want to make a difference in the world, do you think that the best way you can make a difference in the world is by being a friend? Yeah. The biggest way that you can be, make a difference in the world is by being a friend to somebody else. Jesus talked about to his disciples because they were having an argument about greatness, and they all wanted to be really, really great. And Jesus said that real greatness isn't found in being, in being super popular or having a lot of power or having a lot of money or having a lot of cool trophies. Real greatness is found in how we serve each other. So do you think we can serve each other? 
yeah, I think we can do that. I think, can you be a friend tomorrow? Can you be a friend with the rest of your day today? Yeah, I think we can do that. I think we can make a difference in someone's life by helping them through a hard time, by being a good teacher or being a good example, or by helping just make sure that, make sure that someone feels appreciated. And speaking of appreciation, can we, tell, can we tell Carla we appreciate her by telling her thank you for being a part of this this morning? Can you say thank you, one, two, three? All right, then we are going to pray. I'm going to say a phrase ever repeated after me. Dear God, we thank you for people who have made a difference in our lives. We thank you for our opportunity to make a difference for others. Help us to be a friend today and every day so that we may serve you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up this morning. You can hit the treat basket and head back down to your adults. Our scripture this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 10. I'll be reading verses 35 through 45, and the reading in your pew Bibles begins on the very bottom of page 30, uh, 63, and then goes on to page 64 if you wanted to follow along as I read this morning from the Good News Translation. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, there is something we want you to do for us. What is it, Jesus asked them. They answered, when you sit on your throne in the glorious kingdom, we want you to let us sit with you, one at your right and one at your left. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you are asking for. Can you drink the cup of suffering that I must drink? Can you be baptized in the way that I must be baptized? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup I must drink and be baptized in the way that I must be baptized. But I do not have the right to choose who will sit at my right and my left. It is God who will give these places to those for whom he has prepared them. When the other ten disciples heard about this conversation, they became angry with James and John. And so Jesus called them all together to him and said, You know that the men who are considered rulers of the heathen have power over them, and leaders have complete authority. This, however, is not the way it is among you. If one of you wants to be great, he must be the servant of the rest. And if one of you wants to be first, he must be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you. For you, O God, are our rock, and you are our redeemer. And we give you thanks for who you are as we say together, Amen. This might be one of the hottest takes I ever make from this pulpit. And I want you to know from the very start, you are free to disagree with me and also to call me crazy. But I think we will all admit that the world has become more self-servicing. Not self-serving, it is, but we're not going to talk about that today. The world is becoming more self-servicing, and I have to tell you that I am absolutely here for it. I like it a lot. I I, I do. Whether it be the self-checkout at Sunshine, or the ATM at the bank, or just the kiosk to order your food at a fast food restaurant, I kind of like all of those things. Maybe it's because I'm a people pleaser and I don't want to be a burden to other people and I'm, I'm very millennial in that. Um, but I just, I, I like this move to more self-service. And I know that this feels like this is a modern development and certainly the advancement of technology has accelerated this move to the world being more self-servicing. But I really think the origins are found further back in our history. I think that this move to self-servicing started when the very first self-service-only gas station was opened in Los Angeles, California. Does anyone happen to know when that happened, when our move to self-service gas started? 
What's that? The 70s is a good guess, but it's a little bit even earlier than that. The first self-service-only gas station opened in 1947 by a, na- by a man named Frank Ulrich. And if you fast forward to what Carla said, when you fast forward to the 70s, the ratio of self-service to full-service gas stations went to about 50-50. And now in our time, full-service gas stations are almost unheard of unless you find yourselves in the, state of New- in the states of New Jersey or Oregon where it is literally illegal to pump your own gas due to wanting job security and due to the safety of their patrons. New Jersey and Oregon will not let you pump your own gas. And the reality is that many people disagree with me that that self-service is better than full service, and I have to say that that's okay. Because I will admit that there are times when full service feels really nice. You walk around the grocery store, you make your selections, you place the items on the belt, And then someone checks them out, someone else bags them, and someone else carries them out to your vehicle. There are times when that's really, really nice. And I have been to a full-service gas station before, and it is really kind of nice to pull up to the gas station and tell someone that you want $40 of your preferred gas and then remain in your vehicle for the duration of the transaction. And especially as we look at the forecast over the next couple of months, that idea of full-service gas stations sounds awfully nice. But what I want us to hold on to is that Jesus' idea of full service, made known in our scripture this morning, is not our modern idea of being full service. While being full service in our world seems like a luxury or maybe even an expectation, Jesus is not interested in our version of full service, in our idea of full service. In our scripture for this morning, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, disciples of Jesus Christ, prove a little bit of why Jesus refers to them as the sons of thunder because they come to him with questions that end up being nothing more than loud noise and an expansion of hot air. James and John come to Jesus and ask him two questions, the first question designed to determine the outcome of the second question. And they first ask Jesus to do whatever it is that they say for him to do next. And notice that Jesus does not answer that question. And notice also that the sons of thunder remain undeterred. As they get to asking him what they wanted to ask him in the first place, which was when Jesus comes to the fullness of his glory, when Jesus takes his throne in the kingdom of God, that Jesus would allow James and John to sit next to him. One at his left and one at his right. And they believe so strongly in this desire, they have this this belief so well held that they don't necessarily care that Jesus did not answer the first question. They can't guarantee the outcome, but they ask anyway. What I want us to see is that at the heart of this question is that the disciples want Jesus to be full service for them. The disciples want Jesus to be full service, to meet every extent of their needs. James and John want Jesus to fulfill their deepest desire for power and prestige without having to do any of the things that Jesus has already called them to do or what Jesus will go on to call them to do. What gets revealed is that James and John see their time of following Jesus as something that is going to be a pathway to greater things. They see following Jesus as a way to lead to a life of luxury, to a lifetime of full service when they are among the 12 greatest people in the entirety of the kingdom of God. And if Jesus will do this insane thing that they've asked Jesus to do, they will be the two greatest of the twelve greatest. How awesome would that be? But 
But Jesus says to them, you have no idea what you are asking for. You have no idea what you are asking for. And Jesus asks his own questions in return. Jesus says, can you drink this cup of suffering that I am going to drink? Can you be baptized with the type of baptism that I will be baptized with? And in the back of James and John's head, you can imagine them thinking, drink a cup? Sure, why not? They are still envisioning this heavenly banquet in the back of their minds, and so the cup that they're going to drink has to be delicious. And a baptism? Sure, baptisms are always fun. Let's be a part of that too. And it sounds like James and John and Jesus are all on the same page, at least in James and John's estimation. But then Jesus does what Jesus often does and completely flips the entire encounter on its head. Because Jesus knows that James and John, and by the way, the rest of the disciples, will drink from this cup of suffering and will be baptized in this same baptism because Jesus knows that he is referring to his death. And Jesus knows what is going to be happening next in the life of the apostles. He knew that they would drink of the cup. He knew that they would be baptized by the same baptized baptism by dying in service for the gospel. And ironically enough, it would lead to the greatness that James and John were seeking in the first place. In Jesus' estimation of things, greatness cannot be bestowed upon anyone. And the seats of, of, of prestige at the kingdom of God are not Jesus's to grant, but rather they are given by God for those that have been prepared for them. And we prepare ourselves to enter God's kingdom by living in the same way that Jesus was. For Jesus, full service did not mean having every, every ounce of their own needs met, but just the opposite. For Jesus, full service means serving fully. Full service is not just sitting in your car while someone else does the work. No, full service is serving fully. A full-service life is a life that sees the needs of others over and above our own needs and then doing something to fulfill someone else's needs. And Jesus ends his teaching by telling his disciples that they and we and all who hear these words will only find greatness in God's kingdom by service. And Jesus points out that even he, even he, the begotten beloved Son of God, even he, the incarnation of God's own self, is not exempt from this idea of serving. As he says to them, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve serve. And Jesus did this in his ministry in the way that he saw people and met people. Jesus lived a full service life by healing those that the world had written off. Jesus lived a full service life by spending time with those that the world chose not to see. Jesus lived a full-service life by enduring the baptism of his death, by drinking the cup of suffering, by dying on the cross so that we might live and die to ourselves and live a full-service life as he envisioned with every breath that God gives us. And while that may seem big and radical, it doesn't necessarily have to be. It can be found in the simplest of actions. 
In his book called Restored, Bishop, uh, our United Methodist Bishop Tom Berlin talks about a woman in his previous congregation named Frankie, and Frankie's service to the kingdom of God was sending notes of encouragement. And Bishop Berlin said that he received these notes throughout the years and that Frankie had this remarkable sense of timing because these notes came exactly when he needed a word of encouragement. Bishop Berlin writes that Frankie had a way of seeing things in himself, in Bishop Berlin, that he himself could not see. Frankie lived a full service, lives a full service life. She writes these notes every Sunday, about 20 to 25 of them per week, and the only reason why she does it is because she decided it would be nice if people knew that someone cared for them. This is a full service life. So as much as I enjoy the way that the world has become more self-servicing, I know that I am called to a full-service life. And so are you. As the world becomes more self-servicing, may we be the ones that show others what a full-service life looks like by seeing people and helping people, by encouraging people, by serving people, all in service to the one who came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. This is how we find greatness in the kingdom of God. Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the example of Jesus and for the way that it inspires us to, to move and to work and to serve in this world. You have given us examples of service to follow. Jesus and the disciples and the characters of Scripture, but also people in our own lives who have been servants of yours to bless and benefit others. You've given us teachers that have inspired us. You've given us friends to, to help guide us through hard times. You have given us every opportunity to then go and do likewise. And so inspire us today to live a full service life in your name. Amen. Stand as we are comfortable to sing together the summons, which is found on page 2130 in The Faith We Sing. We will sing the first four verses, receive our benediction, and then bring worship to a close by singing verse 5. Let us stand and let us sing the summons.
Before our benediction, I just want to invite you to remember that we also have our loose change offering today. It is going to be going to benefit our Chi Alpha program. So the buckets are out. Look for an adorable line of helpers uh, to help take that offering as you exit worship this morning. But let us receive this benediction together. Dear friends in Christ, James and John came to Jesus and asked for Jesus to do something for them. We want places of honor in God's kingdom. They did not understand what they were asking, and we admit that we don't always either. Dear friends, can we endure the hardships and blessings of a full-service life? With God's help, we can. Jesus reminded them, whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be servants to all. Jesus, help us to become the servants you have called us to be. Let us sing verse 5 of the summons to bring worship to a close. Go in peace in the, service to, in the service of God. Go forth to live a full service life. Amen. Thanks for being here this morning.